So welcome to the Demography Today uh, lecture series, sponsored by the BBVA Foundation and uh, co-organized with the Spanish National Research Council in collaboration with the Lompoc Horizon 2020 project. And uh, we have uh, the pleasure to have uh, today our last uh, talk for this year, uh, Peter Christen, uh, one of the uh, big names in, uh, in data linkage and in, uh, in uh, uh, management of uh, data in, uh, in general. So he uh, is uh, from the Research School of Computer Science in the Australian National University in Canberra. Uh, he he uh, received his diploma in Computer Science Engineering from the Technical School in Zurich in 1995 and his PhD in Computer Science from the University of Basel in Switzerland in 1999. His research interests are in data mining and record linkage with a focus on machine learning and privacy preserving techniques for record linkage. He has published over 140 articles in this area, including in 2012 a bestseller that is uh, data matching published by Springer. And you can see more details in his uh, biography. Uh, as uh, you know, today we will have uh, not only the lecture that it will last for one hour or one hour, one hour and a half, we will have later a break, and after the break, we will carry on with a training course that it will last for another three hours. So we will have a live transmission during during the, the morning. So welcome, Peter, to Seville and to our lecture series. And uh, whenever you want, uh, the floor is yours. It's great to be here. Um, and before I start. So the first talk is about work I've been doing together with my PhD student Charini. I'm a postdoc pillar. Before I start, I need to do some advertisements uh, for, not for another book, but it's for upcoming um, special editions for journals. So the first one I'm involved in is, um, I'm a kind of an associate editor for the Royal Statistical Society, um, and they have an upcoming special um, edition of the journal Data Science for Society and Challenges, Developments and Applications, which you might be interested in contributing, submitting something. So the deadline for this um, is at the end of November. Um, so this is really about the applications of data science um, in the in for society. Right? That's the first one. The second one is for a relatively new journal. I'm also on the editorial board for this, the International Journal for Population Data Science which is really about linking data and what we can do with linked data. So this is really, it's only about two, years, um, two or three years old, this journal. This is really the journal we like to have research and applications published about data linkage. Um, so as you can see, there's all kind of um, topics about linking data, about applications, using big data, um, evaluations, use linked data in health and social sciences and policy, etc. So it's a, multidisciplinary journal, uh, not just for computer science, for people in the social sciences, health sciences, uh, history, demography, etc. Uh, it's just a few things. So it's an open access journal. So if you uh, want to publish something, or if you're looking for uh, articles about data linkage, then increasingly people are publishing this journal. Um, OK, having said that, so this is what I'm going to talk about in the first lecture, is our recent work on temporal clustering, um, and also something which we've just submitted to a journal paper is about measuring the quality of data linkage, which is actually a big challenge as well. And this is part of a project called Digitizing Scotland. So before I'm going to talk about what we're doing, I'm going to show you a few slides, which are, uh, is about the Digitizing Scotland project. Some of you might know Professor Chris Dibben, who's the uh, chief investigator, the principal investigator from the University of Edinburgh. As you can see, it's a multi-university uh, difficulty, a new, uh, <laughs> a new label here. It's a multidisciplinary, um, multi-university project. All we aim to basically do is, it's funded by the um, United Kingdom Economic and Social Science Research. What we basically want to do is something similar to what you want to do here is, uh, we're transcribing, or the commercially transcribing birth, deaths, and marriage records from 1855 to, 1970, to the 1970s. And then once we have these birth, deaths, and marriage records, we want to link them together and reconstruct the whole population of Scotland, basically. So very similar to what you want to do here. Um, so um, we, 
as I just mentioned, they're going to have we have these images. They're being transcribed in a company in India, um, and so we get very large database tables, and we're going to link them together. And the research I'm going to talk about in, in this talk here is one small aspect of some of the challenges as we have temporal delta spanning 120 years. Um, we're also going to look at death causes and occupation strings. Again, something you are doing here as well. Um, so the idea is to really reconstruct the population and then have a very large resource where social science, health research, and policy research can be done. Um, yeah, we can, for example, look at social mobility over several generations. We can look at uh, heritability and genetic patterns of disease. One thing we're looking at at the moment is uh, the 1918 flu and the uh, female mortality or maternal mortality, how the flu has uh, 100 years ago has affected uh, the number of women who died after childbirth. That's a, that's a small initial project we're working on. Okay, having said all that, this is now the outcome of my talk. Um, so I'm going to give a quick introduction about what is group record linkage and why do we have to cons be concerned about what temporal constraints are. Um, and then the main work in the first part of the talk is about how to look at these temporal constraints to improve linkage quality. Um, and specifically what we're looking at is we want to link all the, rec all the birth records by the same parents. So this is called birth bundling. So basically find all the brothers and sisters who have the same parents. And of course, you can imagine there are temporal constraints with regard to when birth can happen by the same mother. Um, I think in as we did this research, we realized it's very difficult to evaluate how good our linkage is. So we actually then kind of did a sidetrack in our research and we start to look at cluster quality. So how good are these birth families? How, how accurate are, is our linkage technique? And that's research which is still working. And then I end up with a few conclusions and few results. Okay, so historical group record linkage is basically about we want to identify records which correspond to the same group of entities. So this entity we mean a person. Um, in record linkage, generally entities can also be businesses, they can be consumer products. I'll talk more about this in the tutorial later on. But here we're concerned about groups of people, so siblings, brothers and sisters who have the same parents. Um, so we want to link them together. It could also be a household in a, from a census data set. Um, they really to find these groups, so we call them clusters. And so um, what we have is we have birth records, we have marriage records, we have death records, and the bundling of finding all the siblings is one step to reconstruct the whole population. So, um, so once we know siblings, then this is, we can then link them with marriage records later on and death records, and it allows us to build um, the pedigrees of the, the family trees of the whole population. So what? What's the actual problem statement we're trying to solve here? Um, we try to identify groups of records that refer to the same entities where there are some temporal constraints and explain on the next step what these temporal constraints are. Um, in, more, in more detail, specific for our work. Um, so the thing is what we realized is that existing record linkage techniques don't really take temporal aspects into account. There's actually a lot of temporal aspects, not just in historical data, but also in modern data. So I mean, for example, in Australia, we know from the census that every five years, something like 30% of the population moves. So if you have two records which are five years apart with the same name but a different address, that could mean that's the same person who moved, right? So that's a temporal aspect. Um, that's not a temporal constraint, but that's something which can be taken into account. Here we're looking at constraints. So if we have two birth records which are five months apart, they cannot be by the same mother, right? That's the constraint, that's kind of the limitations we're looking at. Um, and of course there's other, there's cultural constraints, there's geographical constraints as well. So the data set we have, uh, which is, um, I'll talk more about this a bit later on, is from the Isle of Skye in northwestern Scotland. Um, if we have two records which one is from one end to the other, the island, the other record is on the other end of the island, and we know in between are lots of mountains, then it's very unlikely that these are actually brothers and sisters, right? Because the families in 1850 has very unlikely moved from one end to the island to the other end, right? because in those days people didn't move around a lot. So that's what we have a geographical constraint, uh, constraint, a cultural constraint could be 
that somebody, somebody who, uh, from a low socioeconomic family, let's say a farmer, is never going to marry uh, a prince. Well, that's things which are not going to happen uh, just because of the structure of society. So these are things which we're going to look at maybe in the future. Uh, another thing which you have, of course, um, you must be familiar with this. If you go back in time, you have handwritten um, birthdays and marriage records. I'll show an example in the next few slides. Uh, there's transcription errors from the handwriting into electronic form. Um, and again, I'll talk more about this in the tutorial as well. Um, there's, uh, there's errors, there's missing data. Um, there's actually a lot of missing information we have with regard to occupation, for example. Um, and the other thing is that, especially the data that we are working on, is a very skewed fre frequency distribution of names. Um, as I said, the data set we have is one island in Scotland, and it's, if you know a bit about Scotland, there's regions where people from the same Scottish clan live, so they all have the same name. They all call them uh, the McLeods and the McDonalds, so these, these are the local people, and they have, pretty much have, uh, many have the same first name, and many have the same last name. And so it's very difficult to do name matching, so nominal record linkage is much more difficult because you have a large proportion of the, the people have the same name, and for some reason they also seem to marry women who have the same name. So we have something like five pairs of bride and groom which have exactly the same name, right? That's what's probably not what you have nowadays because people move around more. Okay, so what's this constraints-based temple or temple constraints-based clustering? So we wanna, as I said before, we wanna find all the brothers and sisters, but we know that if you have two birth records in our database, which are five months apart, then biologically they cannot be by the same mother. The funny thing is, as we did our research and we got it accepted at the conference uh, in April, there was this news item down here. A Bangladeshi woman with two wombs has twins one month after the first birth. <laughs> so, okay, data, the real world is always weird and strange. So this will basically be now um, three babies by the same mother who have a time difference of one month, right? So we wouldn't link that woman, <laughs> but that's only one in 100 million, right? So, um, so the idea is, um, if we have, so we would basically do is we have some sort of what we call the plausibility. You kind of kind of see as a as a probability from a statistical Bayesian background. So we can basically say that the plausibility that Two births which have the same date are by the same mother is one. These could be twins. Right? Uh, and sometimes we have maybe one birth is on, on a Saturday and the second birth of the twin is on a Sunday. Right? So one day apart is possible as well. We even have in our data set uh, one example where they're two days apart. Um, three days, mm, that's going to be a bit hard. I'm not a, um, I've never heard that, that this is going to happen, right? potentially. It shouldn't happen between three days and roughly eight months. Again, that could be an early birth, but then from nine months to 30 years, two birth records that far apart can be by the same mother. Um, and again, talking to our colleagues, Ili and, and Alice from Cambridge, who are experts, they basically said it's very unlikely that a woman has uh, two births more than 30 years apart, especially in the eight, uh, 1900s. Uh, having said that, we actually do have, in our data set, two births which are 16 days apart. And we, we queried Alice and Lily, why is this the case? And what happened is that apparently um, they were twins on the Isle of Skye in 1870 or so. The first baby was healthy, so they registered the birth. The second baby was very sick, and they didn't know if it's gonna survive. So they actually waited for two weeks before they registered the birth. So we now have two births by the same mother, 16 days apart. Um, so there's all these weird things happening. Okay, so let's go through the steps. And I know most of you are computer scientists, so I tried to explain this at a very high level what the basic ideas are of our algorithms. Right? So, so we start with, these are the, the birth records which we have. We don't look at images. We get electronic versions of those. Right? So we basically get a table or a spreadsheet where we have names, um, we have the date of the birth, we have details of the baby's name, the mother's name, the father's name, we have addresses, we have patients, and things like this. Um, and so the first thing we do is this traditional pairwise linkage. We compare the names, the nominal linkage approach. Uh, we compare names. Um, 
we only compare birth records with a plausibility one. So we're never going to compare births which are five months apart. So for example, um, as you can see, this one is from the 3rd of September 1980, and this is the 1st of January. Um, no, wait a minute, this, where was it? Okay, now all of these examples we, we can compare. Um, and what we get at the end, so each comparison gives us a, a similarity value between 0 and 1. I'll explain that in more detail in the tutorial later on. Similarity of 1 means the names are exactly the same. So of course not the name of the baby one, because the baby's name is going to be different. But the names of the parents and the address is going to be exactly the same. That's a similarity of 1. If the names and the address is completely different, then the similarity is 0. The similarity of 0 0.9 means that we have something like, um, what do we have? Suppose so peg one and peg two watches might be similar to zero point eight. So the more, the more similar the names are, the higher the similarity is. And so based on this, we can build such a graph where each node, each of these circles, is a record, and the edges, the lines between those, are the similarity. So for example, we would say that record U and T have a similarity of zero point six. So Maybe they are brothers and sisters, right? Um, the higher the similarity, the better. Now, because the way we do this pairwise linkage, we might end up with a graph such as that. Now, clearly, this is not a family, right? That's hopefully not. Um, that's a lot of babies by the same parents. Right? So, and also, as you can see, is even though M and K are exactly the same, they have the same parent's name, um, the similarity between M and, for example, H would be very low. But we get this change because of the pairwise linkage. And so the, and what we also know that each of the links is temporally possible. But what could happen is that, that some of the pairs which we don't compare are not temporally possible. So for example, E and A might be six months apart. Um, and so therefore now we have, we can simply say that this whole graph, if we call it connected components, all the nodes which are connected by edges, this cannot be a family one. Because if these red edges are not temporally possible, then we have something which is contradicting the result of, of finding brothers and sisters, right? So we basically have to do something with these inconsistent graphs. And that's kind of our work. The way we do this, we use a recently developed technique by colleagues of us in Germany, Edward Graham and his PhD student Ali Saidi. They basically, um, they are, again, looked at such a graph and they categorized edges into three different categories. They call the edges, they have strong, norm, and weak edges. A strong edge is an edge which has the highest similarity for both nodes. So these are the red ones here, right? So for example, from M and K, uh, because this is 1.0, this is the strongest, this is the highest similarity for both M and for both K. For C and B, this edge here is 0 0.95, it's the highest similarity, as you can see, for both C and B, right? So we, we have the, the red ones are the, the orange ones are the, the strong ones. The blue ones, the normal nodes, are the highest from one side only. So for example, H, H to F, this is a, uh, a normal because it's the highest from F, but it's not the highest from H. So basically we generate, we, we label, we kind of color each of the edges in one of two, three things, strong, normal, and weak. And so then we have a kind of a simplified graph. We don't use the similarities anymore. But now we can generate um, a clustering based, for example, only on the strong, on the strong edges, right? And that's what we're doing. So we basically generate what we call base clusters, which are only using the strong links. That gives us small clusters. These are the ones which are really high quality. Right? These are the, the best links between two birth records. Um, but the problem is we still might get inconsistencies, temporal inconsistencies, so, right? So we might end up with um, a, a smaller cluster such as that. And then we have this not temporal, these inconsistencies. So C and F might again be two birth records five months apart. So we somehow have to split these clusters. Um, I'm not going to go into the technical details. I'm happy to share the, the papers on our website. So we somehow have to find which is the best, which are the best edges to cut. So we end up with small clusters which are 
chemical impossible where every pair um, is not the five or six months apart birth rate. So we basically do some calculations. We rank the nodes according to which one is the best. So if you look at here, so F, for example, if F has 0 0.7 and 0 0.75, it's a fairly low similarity edges. If we cut these two edges, this is also not technically possible, then you end up with a, a triangle here, which is plausible, right? That's consistent. And we have something here, which we still have to do something. So the second step, we can cut this edge here, and therefore we end up with three small clusters which are now temporarily possible or plausible. So there are, there's no inconsistencies, right? This could be now basically three families. So these are three babies by the same parents, these are four by the same parents, and this is a single baby by the family. So this works fairly well, right? So we basically cut the clusters, then we have very small clusters. But then we have to kind of put them back together. So we, when we realize that at the end of this first step, we have high quality clusters, so they have a high position, and we'll talk about this a bit later on, or we don't we, we lose a lot of links, right? Because of the way we only because we only use the strong links, uh, the strong edges. So we basically do now a merging where we also consider the normal edges, or maybe even the weak edges. Remember, strong, normal, weak, right? So we, we put them back together, and again there's a merging step involved, uh, which we'll go into the details. Uh, we look at the overall similarity between all, all record pairs in clusters. And so at the end of this, and we also look at the coverage, so how many, um, how many edges between two clusters are included. Again, I don't want to talk about the details. Um, if you see, have we look at the paper. And so the, the basic idea is we have base clusters, we split them to make them temporally possible, and then we put them back together. So at the end, we have high quality clusters which are temporally each of them is temporally possible, I right, course. Okay, so how did we evaluate this? I mentioned before we have a data set from Yellow Sky. If you, if this is Scotland over here, Edinburgh, Glasgow, uh, Loch Ness is somewhere over here. Yellow Sky is over here. It's a small island. Um, it has something like, I think the population uh, was about 30,000 people in the 1900s. Now it's uh, much lower, except over summer when thousands of tourists arrive and have a look at it. Um, and so basically we have a data set of roughly 17,000 or 18,000 birth certificates covering the whole population of the Isle of Skye from 1861 to 1901. Um, and our colleagues um, at, in Cambridge, so Alice and, and Ely and, and her colleagues, they worked on this data set for the last 15 years roughly, I think, and they manually generated what we call the ground truth. Right? So they manually linked or semi-automatically linked them they're, they're, really, they're very experienced in these kind of data sets. Um, so they really identified all the families, what they believe is. Of course, we never can be 100% correct, right? because that's 150 years in the past. But we have a ground truth data set, and therefore we can evaluate how good our clustering technique is. Right? Um, we use different ways of how we compare records. So we um, this similarity calculation. The first one is we use all available fields or attributes, we use the parents' names, the addresses, the occupation, as well as the date of marriages, if we have them, um, if, if uh, parents were married. There's a lot of unmarried women as well, because in these cases we cannot use the marriage dates, because there's no marriage date. And the second um, type of similarity calculation is we only use the parents' name and the addresses, and the third one we only use the parents' names. And the idea is to kind of evaluate because we know people do move around a little bit and addresses are changing over time as well. So uh, what is the best way to compare records? Um, I mean, we do this with weights and without weights. So we use this Felici Santo model. Again, I'm going to talk about it in the tutorial. We have advertisement for the tutorial. Um, so we have six different ways of how we compare records. So we get six different versions of our similarity graph. How do we evaluate things? So we use something called precision and recall. Uh, precision is basically a measure which uh, shows how many of the links we get are correct. And recall is how many of the correct links or the true links have been correctly found. Again, I'll talk more about this in the tutorial. 
These are two numbers, um, and of course, if you change the similarity threshold, then these numbers are changing, we'll show that as well. And therefore, what's commonly used is this thing called the area under the curve. I'll explain that on the next slide. Uh, again, talk more about this in the tutorial. So here are these position recall curves, right? So this is a recall value, this is a position value. We run the linkage and we change the similarity threshold for deciding what is a link, what is a match, and what is not a match. And if we do that, we get curves which go from, which kind of go across. So we either have a high position or low recall, or, rec or low recall, high position. So therefore, you get a curve. Right? And just kind of, don't worry about the details. The, better, the higher up the curve is, the better the results are. So the best is having a recall of one and a position of one would be perfect linkage quality would be up here, right? Um, if you have a point down here, that's bad. Right? So the, the higher up the curve is, the better the results are. Um, so as you can see, is with, um, these are different ways of how we do the uh, select edges in our clustering. Um, you can see if we basically use, uh, we always use the strong edges for the base clusters to extract these base class, but then use different combinations to do the, uh, the merging in, this, in the second step. As you can see, is, um, the best is using the normal and then the weak later on. And also, what's actually quite interesting for us is that the green, um, the green curve here, which is names only, gave us the best results, which is normally expected. We expected addresses are more useful and marriage shapes are more useful as well. So the marriage shapes will be for all. As you can see, is all is actually not so good. Right? So names only, even though we have lots of people with the same name, names only gave us the best result. And it has to do that. Um, I think the unmarried women, because you don't have a marriage date there, and the addresses change quite a lot. That's why names only is the strong, the best way to do it. Okay, so the area under the curve is basically everything which is on the on the this in this area here. Right? So the higher the area of the curve, the better um, an approach is. And so in order to, s to kind of summarize these plots into a single number, each line into a single number, we use this area of the curve. Um, and so that's the results here. And so what we did is we compared this technique with an earlier technique, which is a, what's called a star clustering, which is kind of looking, finding a good record, and then attaching other records in the star fashion. Um, and we looked at it in a temporal approach and a non-temporal. So we, in the non-temporal approach, we didn't look at um, these implausibilities. Right? So we simply link records together as being done in the past. Um, as you can see, is we also um, uh, so this is our approach. This is the star class. So as you can see, on average, we get much higher results. Right? So statistically, very significant. Um, 0.82 average area under the curve uh, versus the previous star approach. Um, and also, interestingly, the star approach actually worked better when it was uh, non temporal. I'm not sure why this happened. Um, but I think overall, these are fairly good results. Right? The area under the curve of 0 0.82 is, is fairly high. Um, so at the moment, we're kind of con continuing this work. We try to learn the plausibilities from the data, right? because this, this uh, three days to nine months is, is kind of based on what uh, Amy and Alice, our domain expert, told us, but we tried to learn this from data. Right, so as we did this work, as I mentioned before, we, we kind of realized that what does precision recall actually mean? Precision recall, I go back here, this, this measures the, um, the links which are correct, right? So the, the, the links between two records. But we're looking at classes, we're looking at groups of babies by the same mother. So the second part of my talk is about work which is ongoing. We submitted it, we got some really good feedback on the, the submitted journal paper. Um, and the question really is about our position and recall suitable for assessing group record links. So is it, is it good enough to look at the links? Um, right. So, Position and recall have been used in the past for record linkage, machine learning, uh, information retrieval, web search. So they are very common evaluation measures. Um, what they basically measure is they measure the number of true positives, right? So the true matching record pairs. So I need to have a, a set of ground truths links. So I need to know these two records 
Now, these two birth records have the same parents. These two birth records have different parents. If I have a set of those, I can calculate true positives, false positives, so the kind of the wrongly matched links. And I can also find which are the false negatives, the wrongly non-matched recordings. So where the algorithm says these are not siblings, but in fact they run. So if I have these three numbers, I can calculate the position of recall. And that's what anybody's been doing in the last 20, 30 years. But, as I just said before, these measure the quality of links, but not the quality of our clusters, right? And so the next slide, I'm going to give you an example of three different clusterings which have exactly the same position and recall, but completely different clusterings, right? And so we realize that position and recall are actually not good measures for group record linkage. Okay, I hope you can see this. So um, this is the ground truth, right? So ground truth classes. I hope you can see the colors. So let's again assume these are birth records. So we have basically uh, five families. Um, so let's say these are brothers and sister, brother and sister, brother and sister, and two, um, two times three siblings, right? So we have five families. This is the, the truth, right? So we have five families from our data set. Now we run our algorithms. Um, we have three different algorithms, or we've asked three different demographers or historians and geologists to, to, to cluster those, and we get three different results back. So maybe these are first year students, right? So they, they're not very experienced in record linkage, so they kind of look at names and student one comes back with this clustering, student two is this clustering, student three, the third, the third student is this clustering. As you can see, so the dotted lines here are the wrong links. Um, and each of the three clusterings has six true matches. So these are these one, this one, these three, this one, this one, uh, wait a minute, this one, this one, this one, this one, these three, this one, this one, this one. So we have three correct links, and we have four false matches. So the dotted link, the dotted lines are wrong matches by the clustering algorithm or by the first year student who made mistakes. Right? But if you can, there's six true positives and false and four false positives. We also each of the three clustering misses three uh, true matches, and therefore all three clusterings have a position of six out of ten and a recall of six and a recall of six out of nine. So the all three clusterings give us exactly the same result if I use position and recall. But which one of the three clustering is the best? That's hard to say, right? That depends on the application. So if you're a demographer and you're interested in studying families, then maybe this is better than this one, right? Because this is really bad. I don't know. So we're not demographers, we're historians. We leave that up to you decide what is the best clustering. Right? We're just developing the algorithms. So the main point is, all these three results give the same output with regard to position recall. That doesn't really make sense. Right now. Then we thought, about, so what, what do we actually want to measure? Um, and so what we need is a measure, we need measures that assess the quality of the records, not the links. Right? If I want to study families, I want to know which record is correctly linked in a group of other records. Right? This baby or this birth record is correctly linked to four other birth records in the same family. Right? So we thought we need um, a measure which is based on records and not on links. And when we started this in February, so we thought, oh, that's very easy, right? We're going to do this in a week, and then, and it took us a long time to, to really think about carefully about what are the different possibilities of assessing um, records or groups. Right? And we came up with seven different categories which are going to explain. Um, so it's a much more complex undertaking because there's so many different possibilities, right, of what can be correct and what can be wrong. Right? Uh, yeah, another issue is that, of course, the number of clusters um, can be larger than the number of true families in our case, or it can't be less. Right? So I might have a data set which has 10,000 true families, but my clustering gives me 12,000 families. Then I have a problem, right? I cannot, I have, if I have 10,000 true families, I know I have 10,000 mothers, but my clustering gives me 12,000 clusters. So 2,000 clusters, I cannot really give a mother, because we only have 10,000 mothers. 
Um, so we have that problem as well. So uh, the number of related classes can be higher or lower, and that would not be problematic. So we have to think about this as well. OK, so we came up with seven categories, and I go through them now. And then we kind of put them back together into a, a plot and to area into curve numbers. Because people want to have a single number. Um, OK, the first category is very simple. It's a correct singleton. We call that singleton, singleton. We have in the ground truth, so on the left hand side is always the ground truth. So we know this is a single baby by a single parent. And our algorithm predicts that it's a single baby. That's great, right? Singleton, singleton. That's correct. The second one is a wrongly grouped singleton. So a singleton which is grouped. In the ground truth class, the car is a singleton, but our algorithm has made a mistake. The mistake is we linked cow with mat. So that's not good. So it's, it's a mistake. It's a wrong leap. Um, similar, we have a missed group member. So that's the other way around, right? So if the grand truth cluster will be Carl and Max, but we predicted Carl to be a singleton, then we miss a leap. So we call that group singleton. That's right. The fourth category is wrongly assigned group members. So this is where we assign um, a baby from one family to a wrong family. So these are kind of the, the more simple ones. Now, the more complex ones are those. Um, the first one is the one which we really want, exact groups. We have a, a group of, uh, of a cluster of size two or more, and we correctly found that cluster. So here we have Paul and Oscar, colleague of mine from St. Andrews, um, and we predicted that Paul and Oscar are, are brothers, and are two brothers, right? That's correct. That's what we want. That's the best outcome. But that's not always happening, especially as the data has become larger and the data quality is lower. So then we looked at, well, then we can have mistakes. We can have partially correct clusters. And one of them is what we call a majority group match, GG, group group, uppercase M means majority. That is where the majority of records in a predicted cluster are from the correct grand truth cluster. Um, so here we have the grand truth cluster of five siblings. Um, as you can see, this is a predicted cluster, Alice, Chris, and Felix. And you can see that both Alice and Chris are in here. I know that doesn't look very good. We didn't come up with a, again, from the visualization. This is not really what you want, right? but still, both Eric and Diane and Alice and Chris, the majority of the predicted cluster here is coming from the same ground truth cluster. So we still call that the majority A minority match is GG low case M. Okay, here we have these three, Felix, Hugo, and Ines. Those three are the three siblings. And here we basically only identify two out of five. Okay, that's really bad in reality, right? But as an example, it shows only two out of five come from the same ground truth cluster. So hopefully, I mean, this is not really what we want in a practical linkage application. But for, for illustrative purposes, um, that's kind of what we thought this is going to be useful. So now we have these seven different categories. And this is, we developed a uh, program which basically um, takes a clustering results and calculates for each of these seven categories how many records are in each of these seven categories. And so again, we can now, we can now plot these numbers, right? And so again, we can change the similarity threshold, where basically a similarity above the threshold means we we classify two records as being um, in the same cluster, and below we say they're in different clusters. I'm not sure if you can see the colors very well. So here we have connected components pretty much for the, right at the beginning, if you thought all the nodes which are connected by an edge, you put them into one cluster. Um, star clustering is the approach I briefly mentioned before, and the robust graph clustering is the one I explained in details before. And so as we improve the increases threshold, we get different ratios of where records are being inserted in which of the categories. As you can see, is uh, again, I have to look at the, so blue is, colors are not so good, uh, exact group, exact clusters is the blue ones. As you can see, both star clustering and the robust clustering um, get pretty good results. Uh, here we don't get very good results. Um, so but basically, these plots can allow us to not differentiate between different clustering algorithms in a much better way than position and recall. So we can really, we can really see that uh, robust graph clustering has a much lower 
uh, rate of the, the, the mistakes versus kind of the component, for example. Again, this is maybe too much information. Again, the colors are hard to see here. Um, so again, you can calculate the area under the curve. So the area under the curve will basically be everything below the curve here would be one value. Everything below this curve would be another value. Again, it's a value between 0 and 1. 1 means the curve is right at the top. 0 means the curve is way right lower. Um, and so ideally, we can now get seven different area of the curve values. They normalize, so the sum over these different categories gives us should be one. Um, what we ideally want is high values for a correct singleton, correct groups, majority matches and, and minority matches, and low values for the, the really bad clustering outcomes. Right? So that's what we've done here. Uh, this is the area of the position recall curve. Um, and these are the new values here, as you can see. Star cluster, well, this is the robust graph cluster. We get the best area in the position recall curve. Uh, we also get the best exact uh, matching clusters, which is nice to see. So our algorithm is better than star clustering. Uh, we get the lowest, uh, where are we? We get a kind of lower value here, but that's because we have a higher value here. Um, and on the other hand, the connected component is not doing very well. So these are the values where we want to have low. So this is, these are much lower than this one. This is the lowest kind of, and this is definitely the lowest, right? So the connected component assigns many records into the wrong cluster. Right? Um, so this is really kind of a, an initial uh, approach to try to better understand group record linkage and to come up with different measures for that. So, um, so just on Monday, we got feedback for the submitted paper. Uh, the readers really liked it. They didn't like the area of the curve. They didn't explain it well enough. Um, so, but I think there's, there's really acknowledgement that precision recall, that these link-wise uh, measures don't really work for group record linkage. So maybe that's something you could, is useful for your work here as well. Okay, just to finish up this first presentation. Um, so what we've proposed is a new clustering technique which takes temporal constraints into account. We, we're not aware of any other work which has looked at this. I think there's much more to explore and Charlene, our PhD student, that's, that's going to be her PhD, right? So we're also looking at using Markov models to kind of model what's the likelihood that um, after marriage there's a birth, after, after birth there's another birth. So we're kind of really looking at trying to reconstruct uh, the whole population of Scotland using machine learning techniques and taking population information into account, not just the similarities of names. Um, the project developed is based on these link strengths, which I think is a really nice idea, right? So we have strong links, we have normal links and weak links, which can really help to identify these must be birthed by the same mother, the same parents. Um, We've shown in the experiments on the Yellow Sky data set that it works. We now have another data set from Finland. There's a PhD student who did his PhD on a Finnish data set and he published that, having to share that data set as well. Um, again, that's completely different data, so it takes us a long time to, um, to convert it into the format um, and learning about the Finnish names and things like this, which is a bit strange compared to the Scottish names, which we are now. Um, and, uh, as kind of a sidetrack of our research, we realized that we need to develop these new cluster evaluation measures. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to do more evaluation on different data sets. Um, hopefully, the problem is the big digitizing Scotland data set. We don't have any ground proof record data, right? So nobody really knows um, which birth of the, the 7 million birth records we're going to get are by the same families. Um, we want to, as I mentioned before, adaptive techniques to learn the temporal constraints so don't have to rely on domain experts. Um, so kind of look at, from some data, can we say that these two births are possible or not? Um, and yeah, we also want to investigate evaluation measures where no ground truth data is available. So it's about the quality of clusters, right? So how well connected are clusters? Okay, so I think that's, and talk at the end of the first talk, so I'm open to